What's up, everybody? It's Greg with Delta, and this is the Be The Difference podcast. This podcast is all about making you a better person in your life and in your business with coaching on sales, leadership, mindset, marketing, everything under the sun when it comes to being an entrepreneur, and we bring on guest speakers. Today, I am completely humbled and honored to bring on a very special guest. His name is Mr. Rick Yarish. And I've heard his story many a times when I was in the military, but I think it's going to be more powerful you hearing it from him today. Rick, how are you doing? Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm doing amazing, man. I'm doing amazing. And I will tell you right now, you nailed my last name, which is a very <laughs> uh, uncommon thing to do. So I good job that. there. And thanks for having me today. It's an honor to be here with you. Dude, it's an honor to have you, brother. It really is. Um, so for those of you that had, do not know Rick or and never heard a story, uh, Rick is a husband and father of two. Uh, and he retired a U.S. Army sergeant. He is also an expert in hope. Hold on, possibilities exist. Rick was tortured, or sorry, Rick. Ugh, Rick was Rick has toured the country as a motivational speaker, but solo, both solo and with sweethearts and heroes, directed and co-founded by Tom Murphy of St. Albans VT. Rick was deployed to Iraq in de December 2005. On September 1st, 2006, he was severely injured by an IED, improvised explosive device, in Abu Ghraib. For half a year, Rick recovered at the Brooke Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, fighting through second and third degree burns on more than 60% of his body. His right leg was amputated below the knee. He also lost both his ears, his nose, multiple fingers, and most of the function in his hands. Rick says the only reason he would change that fateful moment is if he could bring back his brothers in arms that he lost in combat, Sergeant Luis Montez, Montez and Sergeant First Class Anthony Venets. Rick has spoken to and inspired millions of people from all walks of life, including sports teams, schools, churches, military groups, and nonprofits for his heroic service. He received the Purple Heart. Rick, I can't wait to. I can't. I'm gonna. I'm gonna to turn it over, bro. No, talk, talk about. Talk about. You know what? What was that? What was that like? That experience on that day, and then this yeah. like for it to be because you're a super positive person, I mean, just like the, like the positivity and the light radiating radiating off of you. Yeah. So, you know, like you, you said the word torture. Um, I, I was certainly tortured in that hospital many times by the nurses and the doctors that were there. And I think they would agree with that. They've tortured me in yeah. the hospital during my recovery. Um, you know, my, I talk about my nurses and my doctors and they're, they're the angels in my life. Um, I certainly would not be here today if it wasn't for, uh, the care they gave me, but not only that, the push they gave me when I didn't want to push anymore and, you know, dealing with all those difficult things, they pushed me through a lot of that. Um, but, you know, in that bio that you shared, you know, the most important part was almost the very first thing you said, I'm a father of two and a husband. Uh, my my wife and my two girls, Amy, my wife and my two girls, uh, Tenley and Grace, like those are my life. And I say it's the most important part of my story because like it was a journey to get to them, uh, to get them to be in my life. You know, just all the things that I had to get through, all the things that I had to go through. Um, but all those things led me to them. Mm. So I'm going to share with you my story of how it all led me uh, to them. So uh, I was a cavalry scout. I uh, went through Fort Knox, Kentucky. Huh? Yeah, that's right. 2004. If you ain't cav, you ain't. I'm not going to say it because I don't say it too often. Hey, cav, you ain't shit. You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, so if you ain't cab, you ain't shit. That's right. So I am a scout, proud scout, and um, joined in 2004. Uh, got to Fort Hood, Texas, uh, 4th Infantry Division is who I was attached to. And then I was there for a year and then uh, deployed. It's an interesting place. It's an interesting place. <laughs> Clean, Texas, Copper's Cove, all those places. Yeah, Harker Heights. Um, spent a lot of time in Austin, Texas. You know, there's a little more going on there. Yeah. But, um, you know, I didn't really know what I was getting into when I joined. And this isn't something I share that often, actually. You know, right before we deployed, so I was in Fort Hood for a year. And right before we deployed, my uh, sergeant major, our sergeant major, um, sat us down. So I was a part of 122 Infantry. And uh, they, he sat us down and, you know, kind of that hoorah talk before we go overseas. And um, one of the things that he said when he first started was, you're not all coming home just straight up with us. Like you're not all coming home. And it was like a rude awakening. Like, Whoa. I, and I knew what I, I knew what war looked like, you know, from my buddies who had been there before. And, but I never really thought about not coming home, you know, 21 years old or 22 years old, invincible. That's what you feel like. You're not going to get hurt. You're not going to not make it. Um, and it was true. 
there were there were many guys uh, who were sitting around me that day who did not make it home. Um, so we deployed on in uh, December of 2005. We were in uh, Kuwait for a couple of weeks and then uh, made our trip up to Baghdad. Uh, we were in South Baghdad, a place called Fob Falcon. That's where we started off. And nine months into the deployment, you know, made it nine months and um, went out on a mission like every other day in our Bradley fighting vehicle. And this day was different than most days because this day uh, we hit an IED. Now we had IEDs before, but nothing like this. And uh, that day that IED went through the bottom of my vehicle, uh, right through the bottom up into the turret where I was sitting. And those that know anything about the Bradley also in the turret is where the fuel tank is. And it hit the fuel tank, uh, covering myself, covering my buddies who are in the vehicle with me, Sergeant Montes, uh, Specialist Low, in fuel, and instantly we were all on fire. And I knew the first thing that I had to do, if I was going to survive even the next you know, few minutes, uh, I couldn't think about tomorrow or the next day or a week from now. It didn't, it didn't matter, those things. I had to survive that moment. And uh, the only thing I could do was get out of the vehicle. That's how I had to start. So every day when I climbed into the Bradley, I closed the hatch cover behind me because most people know that when you're going on a patrol, you're supposed to keep those hatches closed, especially if you're in a combat situation um, in case we ever got hit with chemicals. So we closed the hatches. But that day when I climbed in, I actually didn't close the hatch cover behind me. Thank God. Because if I had, there's no way I would have found that little tiny lever that was above my head that I would have had to hit to open up the hatch cover above me. There's no way with the chaos, the smoke, the fire, it wasn't happening. So thankfully I didn't close it and I was able to just climb through the top. Uh, once I got to the top, the next thing I knew I had to do was I had to get off of that vehicle. I had to get away from the fire. Problem was I didn't have time to climb down because uh, I was uh, totally engulfed in flames. So I had to jump and um, 10 feet from the top of the turret to the ground. So it's a long ways down. But, you know, that's a manageable jump in the perfect circumstance. But it wasn't obviously the per perfect circumstance because of the fire and the smoke. I couldn't see. Um, so that second difficult thing was the fact that I was going to have to make that jump blind. And that's what I did. I just took a leap of faith. Hope that I would clear the side of the Bradley. Hope that I would make it to the ground and um, hope that I would do it safely. But when I landed on the ground, it was not safely. I, I landed and I couldn't brace myself for the landing because I couldn't see the ground. And when I landed, I snapped my leg. I broke my right leg below my knee and uh, ended up in an amputation of my leg later on in the hospital. Now, this is where my story gets uh, hopeless, truly, um, because that's when... When I was on the ground and I was on fire, the next step I have to do is put that fire out. I got out of the vehicle. I got off of the vehicle. Now I got to get that fire out. And uh, I did what I was taught to do. Stop, drop, and roll. That's what we do when we're caught, when we catch on fire. We learned that four or five years old. So I rolled around on the ground and I tried to put the fire out, but I could not because there was too much fuel. There was too much fire. Like stop, drop, and roll. I'm sure it works if your shirt is on fire or your pant leg is on fire. Like not if your entire body is engulfed in flames. And then people were like, well, why didn't you just get up and run? Well, remember, my leg is broken. I can't move. I can't, I can't stand. I actually did try to stand and realize my leg was busted. And even if I could, where was I going? My face is on fire. I couldn't see anything. I had no clue. So the most hopeless situation of my life was in this moment because that's when I laid on my back after I tried those things and I looked up into the sky and I just gave up. Like I accepted the fact that I would die in that moment. I didn't know what else to do. I tried the things I knew what to do. Now today in my life today, I know that I may not know the answer of what to do in life threatening situations, but I know that the answer is never nothing that I know. And uh, so I don't know what I should exactly have done in that moment, but it was something. And uh, I had given up. And, you know, hope to me stands up for hold on possibilities exist. And at that time, you know, I wasn't holding on for any possibilities that existed. I didn't know that I'd be sitting with you here today, Greg. I had no idea that I'd be presenting to students in this world, almost 2 million at this point. I never knew I'd have a wife and girls and those are the possibilities that I'm talking about. We don't know sometimes what they are, but if we hold on through really difficult things, we can find out what they are. And today I found out what those things were. Um, but in that, in that day in Iraq, you know, and I, you know, when I talk about this story, you know, people are like, okay, hold on. Possibilities exist. That's life and death stuff. 
Yes, in my situation that day it was, but it's not only life and death. Like we all deal with difficult things in our life. And sometimes those things aren't just life and death situations. They're things that maybe we love doing, something that we've committed ourselves to, what we've been doing for a long time. And then all of a sudden that thing has become really difficult. And we say to ourselves, you know what? I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. It's too hard. If you give up on that thing that you've committed yourself to and you say, you know what? I'm done. Okay. You're never going to see the results that come from getting through it. You're never going to get to see the possibilities that exist. You're never going to experience the reward that comes from getting through those difficult things. And I just know that when something is extremely difficult, that just means there's a bigger reward in the end. When you get through that really difficult things, there's, there's an amazing reward. And sometimes it's just really hard to see what that might be. But again, you got to hold on to find out what that reward is, what that possibilities that exist are. So that day in Iraq, thankfully, I only gave up that hope for a second because I ended up rolling in one direction. No idea which direction that was in. Uh, could have been right back to the Bradley. I had no situational awareness in that moment. Uh, thankfully, it was not. I actually was rolling away from it. And I ended up rolling down a little hill and into a canal that was there, a canal that I had no clue was there. Um, but it was just enough water in that canal to put the fire out. Now, uh, eventually a couple of my buddies found me in the canal and they carried me out. My, my buddy, uh, Sergeant Vinets, who you mentioned earlier in the, in my bio, he ended up passing away a couple of years later, actually in a, in a different, um, war in Afghanistan, but he pulled me out and my other buddy, uh, Staff Sergeant Jackson, uh, pulled me out of the canal and got me up to the top. And about 30 minutes later, the helicopters came and, uh, took me away to a hospital in Baghdad. And then from Baghdad, I flew to um, Launch Duel, Germany. And then in Germany, I flew from there to San Antonio, Texas. And I ended up in that hospital in San Antonio for six months. So half of a year I spent in uh, an amazing hospital, honestly. I mentioned my doctors and my nurses and the amazing people that they are. Uh, I would not be here today if I did not make it there. Because when I made it to Germany, they called my parents and they told my parents to come to Germany. They said, get your passport. My parents didn't have a passport. They said, get your passport and come to Germany. And basically what they were saying was, you need to come and say goodbye to your son because Germany wasn't a burn center and I needed to be somewhere where it was specializing in burns, but I wasn't stable enough to get on the airplane in Germany to fly me to San Antonio. So they didn't think I was, and they had other guys who had to get on that plane and go and they had to get them back. So they were going to leave me in Germany, and basically that was going to be the end probably for me. Um, my parents were getting their passport, and they got another phone call, and the doctor said, never mind, go to San Antonio. We got them on that plane. They said the stars lined up right, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the fact that I got on that plane that day. Um, that's the hardest part of my story. That really is. You know, Talking about Montez for sure is a, a big part of that because I miss him every single day, but I talk about him every single day. I mentioned his name every single day. And the other hard part is my parents, you know, getting that phone call and, you know, the hopelessness that I'm sure they felt uh, knowing that they were coming to Germany to say goodbye to their, to their son. But that was the, that's the beginning, man. That's the, I mean, that's not the most important part of my story. That's just the beginning of my story. That's what the catalyst of um, what propelled me to where I'm at today. Mm. And that's, you know, a father and uh, a husband and a speaker and a restaurant owner and uh, a lot of other things uh, in my life. And, you know, those are the, those are the positive things. I got some negative, I got some flaws as well, just like we all do. Um, but those are the positive, the, some of the positive things in my life. And uh, what happened to me that day in Iraq is what led me here. And I'll tell you right now, and we'll move on to whatever you want to go on to after this. That was the best thing that ever happened to me in Iraq. That was the best thing that ever happened to me because it led to all those things that I just told you about. Man, that's, that is an incredibly powerful story to hear. I can only, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine the amount of, the amount of pain that you were in when you jumped off that Bradley and you're trying to roll around and then you just give up for that, that brief moment and you're still on fire. Mm -hmm. Like it's how many seconds did it take you to open the hatch, get out, yeah. contemplate jumping, jumping, yeah. break your leg, roll around. You've been on fire this entire time. Plus the yeah. disorientation of like going through the explosion and realizing that you are on fire. It's probably been at least a minute 
I would, I mean, I'm guessing, but not quite a minute, but so, it, it was, a you know, and, and I've done this in my head. I've actually gone over that whole scenario in my head, trying to figure it out. I think it, it, it could have been a minute, but I always figured it to be about 30 seconds. About 30 seconds. Yeah. So that's and a long time to be, it's, to be a fire. It's, it's a long time. I, you know, so when I talk to kids in schools and I'm in their classroom with them, I tell them, you know, Hey, it's 30 seconds, a long time in your life. And they're like, no, like 30 seconds is really short. And they're, and, I'm, and then I'm silent for 30 seconds, just out of nowhere. I just don't say a word. And they're all looking at me like really uncomfortable. Like, what is he doing? Like they want to break the silence. They start talking. They're like, uh, I don't know something's wrong with Rick. And then 30 seconds later, I say, that was 30 seconds. Was that a long time? And every one of them's like, yeah, that was a really long time. And I say, well, that's how long I was on fire. Like, that's pretty crazy to think about, you know, like 30 seconds in our life. When we're uncomfortable for 30 seconds, it's forever. Yeah. When we're having fun for 30 seconds, it's the shortest time of our lives. Um, yeah. But when we're uncomfortable, it's it's extremely long. So I put them in an uncomfortable situation by being quiet like that. And it gives them an understanding of how long it really was um, that I was on fire. But I, I just listened to somebody's story the other day, and I believe they said they were they were on fire for 90 seconds. Like, and it was, uh, it's just an unbelievable that somebody can survive that, but yeah. that's a testament to, um, the doctors and the nurses and the medical care that we have today. Cause you know, 50 years ago, probably wouldn't have made yeah. it through that. Yeah. Just the amount of, the amount of, of pain, like in just sheer pain that, that you're going through in that moment when you're like, man, I can't put this fire out. Would it ju just end it? Like just end it already. Stop. You know what I'm saying? Like that must have been the just most traumatic experience so, in that moment of life. So Greg, it's crazy. I had no pain. Really? None. None. So I have kids that when I am in the schools and, you know, they never want to ask that question there because it's, a, it's almost like a silly question. Like, did it hurt when you were on fire? And whenever that kid asks that question, all the other kids look at him and like, dude, you're an idiot. Like, why would you ask Rick that question? Like, of course it hurt. And I said, that's the importance of questions. Like, you don't know that you've never been engulfed in flames. How would you know what it feels like? And now I'm not saying that everyone that's engulfed in flames doesn't have pain, but I did not. My, the fire itself did not hurt my leg. Different story. My leg hurt extremely bad when my buddies grabbed my leg in that canal to carry me out. That was the first time I, not the first time, but um, that was when I really realized it was, it was bad, bad. So the, the pain that I felt that day um, when I was on fire, it didn't hurt. Now that is a totally different story than the hospital. Yeah. That, that hospital, um, it's impossible, impossible to explain that pain. You know, when I go to the doctor today and, you know, I have something going on, like, you know, with my skin being burned and, um, you know, it's very weak in spots and I can get cuts and I can get infections and I go into the doctor and they're like, what's your pain level one to 10? And they say 10 being the most pain you've ever been in. And I'm like, that's just not the right scale because I'm, I, I got some pain going on right now, but it's a one or yeah. point one compared to the most pain that I've ever been in. Um, so my scale is just different now. And in that hospital, I always explain it this way. Um, when I was in that hospital and on that burn unit, and uh, I can remember, so military hospital, you know, we got all types. We got Navy SEALs in there. We got uh, special forces guys in there. We got all different types who uh, are recovering from burns. And uh, burns don't discriminate. And um it'll take the toughest person you've ever met in your entire life and put them on their knees and make them scream that recovery. I can remember that. I can remember the guys in the other rooms and I'm sure they heard me as well screaming. And I can remember being in that shower when they were um, taking some of that skin that needed to be removed and that's where they would oh. remove it. Yeah. They call it debriding the skin. I can remember the screams in that shower and I can also remember dreading the shower they say hey rick you know i've got to take you to the shower today and it was just like please and you would cry you would say please no like please don't take me to the shower and um 
please give me a bed bath. Like you didn't want to have to go into that shower. You just knew it was brutal, but you had to do it. And that's why I also say those nurses and those doctors, they're angels because I can't imagine how they felt having to deal with that with some of the toughest guys they've ever met in their entire life. And that's how they're acting. They're crying because they have to go take a shower. So, you know, we talk about the pain that day in Iraq. It's it's nothing. And maybe that's it. Maybe I did feel pain, but it's it's just nothing compared to the rest of what I felt. So I don't even think about it. Could so it could be your, your, your uh, adrenaline was pumping so hard from the explosion. Right. It was adrenaline. It was um, the fact that my nerves were burned through. Yeah, they, they, the nerves burned through like instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I eventually, I ended up in shock. I don't, you know, you know, I don't think many people remember being in shock. And, but I can remember, um, you know, after uh, probably about four months into the hospital, my, uh, my lieutenant came to visit. Well, he visited me more often than that, but he came and he told me the one thing I don't remember. I remember a lot of it. Uh, the one thing I don't remember, he said that I kept saying over and over and over. He said, I probably said it a thousand times. Don't let me go into shock. That's what I kept repeating over and over. Don't let me go into shock. Now, I'm not going to lie. I don't know a ton about shock. I learned some in basic training. I can remember that in Fort Knox, but I don't remember. I don't, I don't know a ton about shock. So for my mind to go to that and just say, don't let me go into shock. Don't let me go into shock. Don't let me go into shock. I knew the shock was bad. And I can also remember them, uh, somebody coming up and want, wanting me, wanting to give me water out of their, uh, their Camelback or their canteen. And uh, I can remember from basic training, like if you're in shock, you're not supposed to drink water. And I don't remember why I remember that, honestly, but I remembered it in that moment. And uh, so he didn't give me any water. He gave me, he, he wet his shirt and put it in some water and put it over my face and put it on my lips. So I can remember that stuff, but yeah, I went into shock as well. So I think that, yeah, those are the three big reasons that I didn't feel it that day. Yeah. The hospital. They could get, they could have given, and they did. They gave me every pain med they possibly could. That was on Dilaudid for a long time. And Dilaudid is, they, you know, it's, it's heroin times whatever, times a lot. And uh, sometimes it didn't touch, didn't touch the pain uh, that I was, they'd give me morphine or something like that. I'm like, get that away from me. That's not even going to do anything. And you know it. Uh, but Dilaudid was so strong, they couldn't give you a ton. So, um, yeah, I can remember. I can remember all of it, man. And but I'm telling you right now, like I think about all of that and how painful it was and how crazy it was, and I, I think about it and I would go through it all again to get back here. I would go through it all again just to get back to where I'm at today. Because if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't be where I'm at, and I don't know where I would be. And I, and I think I hope that I'd be in a really good place, you know. Because when I joined the army, I didn't really know what the heck I was doing with my life. The army was kind of the answer for that. Um, I'd probably still be in the army right now, which would be great, but, uh, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing today. If that stuff didn't happen, I don't want my parents to have to go through that again. That's for sure. I don't want my buddy to pass away. I don't want Montez to die. Cause he died. He ended up passing away seven days later in the hospital. Like, I don't want any of those things to happen. Um, so if I could change the day, you know, I guess I would to save his life to, to change it. So everybody else didn't have to go through it. But for myself, if I could go through it on my own and get back here, I would. But the problem is I would never get back here on my own. That's impossible. Yeah. I'm, I'm here because of the people that surrounded me and the people that helped me get through it. Going through something like that, that, that is just incredibly traumatic and, and life altering. Um, you know, you have a lot of options of which path you can take. You can, yeah. you, you could have, you could have been jaded and, uh, and upset. You could have, it could have broken you. Right. But you decided to take a more positive route, you know, which is very admirable. And you decided to inspire and become a motivational speaker and to help people through their own challenging times. Because when you really compare it, you're like, it's, it's like, well, am I on fire right now? Well, no. So I guess it's not that bad. I guess I can, you know, pick up the phone and do more dials and do better in my business. And <laughs> like, could be worse. And and so talk a little bit about, about the the path that you had to walk to get to there. Because... I, I'm willing to bet that you probably had some days that you were upset. There's some days that, that, you know, were dark, you know, leading um, into that and, and, and deciding to take a path that was more positive. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of options in life and everything that we do. And sometimes we allow the, we allow ourselves to have too many options. 
And, uh, you know, if you eliminate some of the negative options, then it's not an option. Like, um, you know, one thing um, outside of those diff really difficult things today, where I'm at today, my one of my biggest struggles in my life is my health. And now I'm not talking about what you see with the burns and stuff like that. I'm talking about the things that I can control. And that's uh, my weight. I've always struggled with it. It's just a mindset thing that I've always had a hard time with. But when you eliminate options, you lose the weight. Like with me, um, I did something, uh, gosh, it was probably seven years ago, eight years ago, and I wanted to lose 60 pounds. And uh, I had 60 pounds to lose, but it's just something I've always struggled with. So I uh, had a buddy say, you know what? How about we do this? How about you write me a check? And write it to somebody that you do not like. And uh, if you fail, that person gets your money. So I wrote a check to the Westboro Baptist Church. And I don't know if any of you listening uh, knows who the Westboro Baptist Church is, but they are not a good group of people. Their website is godhatesfags.com. They protest military funerals. They are not a good group. So I, I'm sure they're on a, I'm sure they're a hate group. So if my money went to them, I'm sure I would get on some kind of list. But the point is, I did that because I eliminated failure as an option. I, I and that's when I'm like, I don't want to do that again. That's just because I know I might like take the easy way out and and choose failure. But when I eliminate that and I say, you know what, I'm going to do this, and that that group's going to get my check if I don't do this, I've eliminated all the other options. So I've, that's kind of how I've done a lot of things in my life. I've eliminated all those negative options. Like, I don't want to live my life negatively. But in the beginning, it wasn't as easy as me saying that. Uh, in the beginning, I did want to give up uh, too many times. I just know I'll never get there again because of the difficult things that I already went through. Yeah. But in the beginning, like seeing my face for the first time when I was in the hospital, four months into my hospital stay is when I saw my face. Uh, my doctors and my nurses, my parents, they didn't want me to see my face. They uh, covered the only mirror in my room, actually, with old pictures. So that way, if I ever saw myself, or actually, if I ever went by that mirror, I couldn't see myself because they did not want me to see myself. I was dealing with a lot already. So um, one day, I went out into the hallway. Um, I was in that room all the time, 24-7, basically. And I went out into the hallway one day, and I passed by a Marine who was injured in Afghanistan, and when I saw that Marine, I couldn't believe how bad he looked. His burns were really bad, uh, almost how scary he looked. And in my mind, I was saying to myself, thank God I don't look that bad. Thank God I don't look like him. But I didn't know what I looked like. I hadn't seen myself. But I've never seen anything like him in my life. So how could I also look like that? Like if I've never seen anything like him, there can't be two. So thank God I don't look that bad. Um, so after an hour in that hallway that day, I went back to my room. And then about a week later, I was laying in my bed and I asked my mom for my laptop that I had over in Iraq with me. And I had all my pictures on that laptop, all the pictures I took from Iraq. And uh, I wanted to look at the old days, the good old days, reminisce. So she brought me my laptop and she opened up the cover. And uh, when she opened up the cover, guess what I saw? My reflection. For the first time in four months, I saw my face. And like I said, my parents didn't want me to see myself and this was an accident. Um, and I'll tell you right now, they were right for me to not want to see it. Because as soon as I saw my face, it was the same scenario as in Iraq when I was laying on my back and on fire. This time I wasn't on fire physically, but mentally I was because I was like, what's the point in me ever getting out of the hospital looking like that? Like that Marine that I saw a week earlier when I was like, thank God I don't look like him. I look just as bad as he did. And I was just and I told my mom that day, I said, leave me alone. I said, no more medication. I don't care if I live or die. Like, what's the point in me getting out of here? Who's going to accept me? Who's going to give me opportunity? And, you know, people can hear that story and some people can be like, Psh, like Rick, oh man, what a, what a wimp. But I had no clue how to deal with such a big change in my life that early on with all the things that I was going through. So, um, you know, that hopelessness that I felt that day in Iraq, it was very similar to that hopelessness I felt that day in the hospital. And uh, the hospital knew they had to do something about it. Like, you know, all these stories that I tell, there's a common theme to it. And it's the fact that I didn't get through it on my own. 
And, you know, people sometimes they fight and fight by themselves. And I believe that number 22 a day, and I don't know if that's an accurate number anymore. I don't know what the number is of, of uh, soldiers, veterans, military personnel who take their own lives. Um, that number is a lot of the times because we try to get through way too much on our own. We don't want to admit to other people that we can't do it by ourselves. But who cares? Like, if you can't do it on your own, and if you never ask for help, you won't get through it. Yeah, That's simple things. That's life-threatening things. You won't get through it. We got to ask for help when it's needed. So um, that day, the, the hospital knew I had to do, they had to do something about it. They brought in my psychologist. He sat down with me, talked to me for an hour like a psychologist would, like a doctor would, straight from the book, basically. And I kept telling him, leave me alone. Like, you can't help me. Uh, uh, you don't look like me. You've never been through anything I've been through like this. So just beat it. Get out of my room. And uh, he knew that it wasn't helping. So he, he changed the subject entirely, started talking to me about dead spiders. And I was like, what the hell is this guy doing? Uh, I mean, he was an army guy. So that was uh, part of it. Probably not the best training in the world. Um, but I was really like, what is this guy doing? I'm freaking out right now. And he wants to talk dead spiders. That conversation only lasted about five minutes. Because he stands up and he leaves the room. And I was glad. I'm like, I didn't want him here. He can't help me anyway. So see ya. Uh, he was only gone for about a minute, though. And he came back in the room. Uh, and this time he was carrying something. A big glass jar full of dead spiders. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, this guy is whacked. He's, you know, hopeless people in life. This is just a life thing. Hopeless people, they do some crazy things. And sometimes that crazy thing is giving up. And whatever led to that hopelessness, I don't know what it is, but hopelessness in the end, it leads to people giving up. And that day, that was where I was. That was the crazy decision that I was making. Again, told my mom, no more medication. Um, and I didn't know what he was doing that day, but I said, I, I believed I was crazy. But when he walked in the room with those spiders, I realized that I wasn't crazy. He was he was the crazy one. Like he was, he needed a psychologist to sit down with him and talk about his life. But what he was doing worked. I didn't know what he was doing in that moment. It took me years to figure it out. But all he was doing was he was taking my mind away from that. He took the time. He, he didn't go by the book and then leave my room and say, I can't help him. Yeah. He went by the book, said, this isn't working. I got to do something different. And he came back in and he took my, I forgot an hour earlier, I told my own mom to her face that I don't care if I lived or died. He took me away from that. And in the end, what he did for me was give me hope. That hope that I'm talking about, hold on, possibilities exist without him and the hope he gave me. I don't see these possibilities today because I'm probably not here. We got to hold on to find out what they are. And we need people along the way to give us that hope. And we also have hope that we can give to other people. Yeah. Like every one of us was born with it. We can give it to other people when they're struggling. And sometimes it is picking up the phone for the person that you might not want to talk to that day. Um, but maybe they need you to talk to them that day. So I just think about that stuff. That's was one of the stories along my recovery. Um, you know, and, and, and in that story, you know, I talked about when I saw my face and who's going to accept me, who's going to love me. That's a big one that guys don't want to talk about. And nobody wants to hear me say who wants to wake up next to that guy, the way he looks. You know, if I say that, it's a little more, it's a little easier. But when somebody else would say that, they're like, ooh, how could you say that about Rick? Well, that's just the truth. Who wants to wake up next to the guy with hands like this, with a nose like I have, like my ears gone, my nose gone, like my hair half gone? Like who wants to choose to do that? And, uh, I didn't think that would ever happen. And then, you know, years later, uh, I met my wife, Amy. And, uh, but it, that's the power of hope. Like I can sell hope to people, H-O-P-E, hold on, possibilities exist. And at that time, I was still not believing it until I met Amy. There were parts of it that I didn't believe, like, hold on, Rick, you'll find somebody who loves you. You know, and I've, I've been married to Amy for uh, going on six years now. So like, we have to hold on to find out that the possibilities are amazing. And that's one of those possibilities. My wife and my, my two girls. So that's just one of those hopeless stories that I felt. But I'm telling you right now, there are probably a hundred more of them. That's dude, that's so amazing. That's so amazing. Um, how what got you into pub the public speaking space? Um, 
saying something really stupid to somebody one day. Again, yeah. product, you know, of the people around me. This is, again, the common theme. Um, I went to an event after I got out of the hospital and uh, my mom signed me up for it. I did not want to go because I was in rough shape. I, I, I didn't want to leave the, my comfort zone. My comfort zone for six months was the hospital. Yeah. After that, my comfort zone was the little apartment that I stayed in across the street from the hospital, but not far removed from the hospital. So she signed me up for an event in Houston, two hours away from San Antonio, and I did not want to go. So I was actually in Sugarland, Texas. I did not want to go. I was terrified of going. I knew that um, I wasn't going to be able to ride in my mom's van to the event. They were going to bring a bus to bus everybody over. And I was terrified that um, this bus wouldn't have a lift. Like, you know, they didn't prepare for me, so they probably aren't going to have a lift and I'm going to have to figure out how to get on this bus. And I mean, of course, they're going to have a lift. Honestly, there it wasn't just me that was going. It was going to be a bunch of guys who were missing legs and other limbs and paraplegics, quadriplegics like they were going to have a lift. But I was so afraid that I started training basically to figure out how to get on a bus without a lift. So I had splints built for my hands and they covered my wrist, made my wrist um, strong because I lost a lot of uh movement in my wrists and also they became very weak so i had these splints that kept my wrists straight and strong and i would uh, practice on stairs just lifting myself up sitting down on my butt and pushing myself up the stairs so if the bus didn't have a lift i could still get on and uh, the day comes where this event is we're gonna go to sugarland and bus pulls up and there's no lift and i was like whoa like okay and thank god i prepared for this and i look around and i see the, all these other guys who can't get on the bus because they didn't practice. And I didn't look at them and be like, ha ha dudes, you didn't, you didn't practice for this scenario. I did. Uh, obviously I didn't do that, but they actually had to make the decision on whether or not they were going to, and these are tough guys. These are those guys that I mentioned in the hospital, the, the, those, those seals, those uh, special forces guys, those army guys, those Marines, the uh, air force guys. Um, they um, now we're going to have to get picked up and, carried onto the bus if they decided to go. And that was a really tough decision for them. All of them decided to get on, thank God. But we go to this event, we get there. Uh, a guy apologizes that puts put it on. It was just a mistake with the bus company. And uh, the day after I get there, same guy who put the thing on, he came up to me and he said, what do you want to do? Like that was his question to me. And, uh, you know, at the time I just really wanted to recover because I was still a disaster. You know, I couldn't, I didn't have my prosthetic yet. I was still in my wheelchair. I was a mess. I couldn't do anything on my own. And, uh, but that's not what I said to him. I didn't say I want to recover. I said, I want to be a public speaker. And I have no idea why I said something so stupid because that was terrifying to me. Like being a public speaker was absolutely terrifying. I didn't want to be a public speaker. Why would I say something so ridiculous? I'm pretty sure I got it from uh, being in the hospital and listening to a guy named Dave Reaver. Dave uh, was a Vietnam veteran who was burned very badly. And uh, I watched some shows on him. Um, that's what he was doing. So he made a lot out of his life because he decided to put himself out there and share his story. So I watched him. And I think maybe that's why I said it to that guy that day. And that guy, he's not a public speaker, this guy that I'm telling this to. So obviously he can't really help me in that world. But that's what he said. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's great. Like, you know, maybe we can help you with that. And uh, he, then he walks away. And I was like, okay, that's just what people say. Thank God, because I don't really want to be a public speaker. And then, uh, you know, I go home, back to my apartment. And a week later, he calls. And he says, hey, I got you a public speaking engagement. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like the one guy who follows through with what he says he's going to do, I tell him I want to be a public speaker. Like, dude, you're an idiot. Um, but... I know. So the first thing I do is, you know, what do you do when you don't know how to do something? You Google it. And I typed in how to be a public speaker. And I can remember it was like chronicle.com or something. Like if you type in anything, like how do I do this? Chronicle.com comes up with like the answers. Yeah. And the first thing chronicle.com said was um, look good. And I was like, shit. I'm screwed. <laughs> like, well, okay. So I can't really look good. So I guess I'll buy a suit at least. Uh, so I go out, buy a suit, a nice suit. And then the second one is write some notes down. And so I write some notes down, type some out, and then slide them up my sleeve the day of the event because I can't hold them because I got those splints on my hands to help me. And uh, day comes where I'm speaking. I got this event and I'm terrified. 
I go to the event um, wearing my suit that I got. I got my notes up my sleeve. I look, it's a gym and uh, there's a stage. I get, I get on the stage and I look on both sides of the stage and there's no ramp. It's only stairs. And uh, this is the same guy that booked the bus with no lift. And I was like, dude, like you just hate handicapped people, don't you? Like that's where we're at now. Um, and I wasn't going to get my, my new suit dirty. So I wasn't scooting my butt up those stairs. So I just hopped up the stairs, one leg, hopped up. Somebody brought my wheelchair up. I sat down and I started talking to those people. And I have no idea what I said to them. No clue. Just straight blackout. Like blackout, start talking. Come blackout. Like, oh, what happened? Blackout. I forgot that I wrote notes down. I forgot that there were notes up my sleeve. That's so and funny. I have no clue what I said to them. And I only talked for 10 or 15 minutes. But the importance of that day for me was after it was over and not knowing what I said to those people without much of a plan going in, I realized that every single one of the people in that room was listening to me. And it was because I have a story and the way I look, it's going to draw attention. That's just the way it works. Whether I like it or not, that's the way it works. And if I'm going to get that attention from people, I better come up with something worthwhile talking about so that I can help people. If I am going to have any kind of platform to help people, I better have something really good to help them with. Yeah. So that day when I spoke, even though I did not want to be a public speaker and it terrified me and I'll even say it's something that I hated doing. That's the day that it became something that I needed to do. Uh, not only because I knew it would help people, but also because it would help me. And it did help me that day. So it became something I it started as something I hated, became something that I needed, eventually became something that I wanted to do. And today it's, it's a love. It's something that I absolutely love doing. Um, but it came from something that I hated. That's the growth of it. And, you know, it's, we're almost 17 years later, but I would tell you probably about year six or seven after is when I started to really love, um, public speaking because I know I can help people. And I'm, again, you know, there's some selfishness in it because I get, I am helped as well when I get to share people and people share with people and people get to come up to me afterwards and tell, tell me what I did for that, for them. That means a lot to me. And that's my fuel. It keeps me going. That's well, I mean, I, I completely understand it. And and you should be made to feel good. You should be getting value back from it because of the value you provide. And when you when you do things in the heart of service, so you're trying to provide a value, it is only normal, natural that you're gonna get an immense amount of value back from it as well. Oh, for sure. I think about people that uh I hear uh, I gotta do something for myself. I got to do something for myself. You know, always worrying about everybody else. I got to do something for myself. When I'm doing stuff for other people is when I'm doing something for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what it feels like. I've, my reward comes from not doing nothing. It comes from doing something and doing something for other people. Like it feels good. So I always like challenge people, okay, you got to do something for yourself, but maybe that something for yourself is doing something for others and it's helping people. And, but yes, there has to be uh, some reciprocation at times, you know, those people have to, and that's, you know, in, in our world of sweethearts and heroes, um, sweethearts are the people that carry hope for other people. If somebody's helping you out and has um, given you hope in your life, let them know. Tell them what they've done for you so that they will do it again for somebody else. You know, that uh, that guy I told you about that gave me that opportunity to be a public speaker that first time. I actually just texted him yesterday. I got a text back from, from him today. That was 16 over 16 years ago. He's somebody extremely important, important in my life, and I let him know what he's done for me um, because I guarantee that makes you want to do it for other people as well. Yeah, absolutely. Rick. Thank you so much, brother, for coming on and just sharing some 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 pieces of your story, some in, inspiring some people. I'm gonna try to do something here. Yeah, I'm gonna change my my speaker to default. Uh, no, the MacBook. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a video for Instagram so you can say hi to everybody and they can hear you. All right. If you're okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do this.
actually. Uh, uh, cancel. Yeah, do that. See if I can get trying to make this screen bigger. I've never done anything like this. Uh -huh. I think this is super powerful. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, uh, nope. I don't know how to do it. That's, oh, techn well. that's technology. Oh, well. Technology. What are you going to do? It's all good. Okay. What's up, everybody? I am here. We are live with Mr. Rick Yarish, and we are doing a podcast recording. He is telling his story. Super impactful. This is one of the most incredible stories of challenge, of obstacles, of overcoming those things, and in clinging on to hope. So, Rick, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say hi to the, to the audience. What's happening, uh, Greg's Instagram family? Uh, what's happening? Um, I've been sharing my story for the past 45 minutes with Greg, and I, I never get tired of sharing the things that I've gone through in my life because I know it can uh, help other people. And uh, if you get an opportunity, make sure you check this podcast out. Uh, with me, Rick Yarish. It's been an amazing chance to uh, inspire and help others. That's it. All right. Uh, be on the lookout for the episode when it hits, but always be the difference. We'll see you guys. Boom. That was good. Uh, that was I like good. it. That was so awesome, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, where can people where can people reach out to you and find you if they want to learn more about you? I'm yes. actually going to tag you in this now while I'm doing it. Sweetheartsandheroes.com is um, where uh, you can find uh, the organization that I speak with. Um, you know, we're an anti-bullying campaign. That's what brings us into schools. We've spoken to almost 2 million students across the country. Um, but we can take the word bullying right out of the presentation. It's the same exact presentation. It's about it's taking right. care of each other and uh, recognizing what the people around you are doing for you and also recognizing what you can do for the people around you. So uh, sweetheartsandheroes.com, uh, all of the um, social, well, not all the social media, we're kind of an old person group. So all the social media as in like Facebook and Instagram. And uh, I think we have a Snapchat and maybe even a TikTok. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't use that stuff. I'm confused by it all, but I think we have one. So sweethearts and heroes, if you look us up, um, we're on all of that stuff. And uh, I know actually we have some really amazing content on YouTube and um, all those things. So, yeah, man, I lo love doing what I'm doing. And again, I am a product of the people around me. Yeah, I have to be strong. That's for sure. We all have to have strength to get through things. But we also have to be um, mindful of the people that are around us that are helping us get through it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Do, do you have an Instagram? Is it? Is it are you at Rick Yerish? Yeah, that's me. Okay. I that's thought so. Me. Trying to tag yeah, so, you in this, in this yeah, video. Perfect. And then I have my own social media stuff too. But again, I'm terrible with all that stuff. Awful. Yeah. I'm, I'm still I'm still tagging you. So look at, look at my Instagram. My last post was over a year ago. Terrible. <laughs> and, and then you'll see one that I did where I uh, found a filter that I was on fire. And uh, it was me singing Johnny Cash, burning, burning Ring of Fire while I was on fire. Was that's, pretty. dude, that's, at least you're, at least you have some humor about it. I like that. Dude, that's actually I have, really, that's really I have no ears and no nose. If yeah. I didn't have a sense of humor, I'd be screwed. Listen, I, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's, I find that the most people in the military are like that, anyways. We just have a really sick sense of humor. Yeah. So it kind my of gets buddy, you in dark times. My buddy who had pulled me out of that canal when he was standing over top of me and uh, helping me deal with it, I asked him a silly question. I said, "How bad is it?" And as a good friend would do in that kind of situation, you lie to the person, and that's what he, he did. He said, You're, "It's not that bad." Well, I looked back at him and I said, well, at least I'll never be as ugly as you are. And I was just on fire for 30 seconds. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you got to have that sense of humor. Yeah, to. yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, so Rick, the last question I ask all my guests is if you had the opportunity to um, sit down with, learn from, break bread with three individuals, anyone in history, alive or deceased, who would those three be and why? All right. So my table is a strange table. It's a weird table. So number one, Jesus Christ. Okay. You know, that's strange. yeah. And that's, that's, you know, a common answer, but mine is more like, you know, I, I have faith in my life, but my faith is also one of the outside of my health. My faith is my other struggle in the world. I want to have a stronger faith. I struggle with it. I really do. Um, just like I struggle with my weight. So, you know, I just want to talk to him and uh, have that conversation. Just get to know him. 
That's what I would want to do. Uh, the second one is Chris Farley because there's no one cooler than Chris Farley. Now he is no longer alive. Yeah. Um, but I, I loved Chris Farley. And uh, the third, you know, my, my table, unfortunately, is all deceased today, uh, is Einstein. Einstein is my He's third. a good one. I don't get Einstein. that one a lot. Yeah, well, you know, Einstein, obviously, one of the smartest men ever, people ever to live in this world. Um, but he said some amazing things outside of like science stuff. He uh, made a statement one time saying that this world is a dangerous place, not because of evil people, but because of those who choose to do nothing about it. Yeah, I want to talk to him about that, you know, like because that's a fact. There's always going to be evil in this world. We will never get rid of all the evil in this world. But when we do nothing about it, that's when we have the problem. When we let that evil thing, that evil person do what they do, that's when we have the problem. So I love that statement. You're never going to get rid of all the evil in the world. But if you don't do anything about it, man, that's where things can be bad. And that's my table. I like I like the, all three of those. Um, and I like that quote. I like how you brought that back. That's amazing. Um, especially given the state of the way that the, the, our, our culture and our civilization yeah. is today. Right. It, but so, so that puts, that puts the responsibility on us. That makes it easy to not point the finger at that person who's you believe is the, the person who's making everything so awful. Mm -hmm. Do something about it then. Do something about it. Absolutely. You, you know, get a group of people and say, you know what, we got to figure this out. How do we, what do we do? Yeah. Like, don't just say, oh, my God, that guy, that girl, that woman. Like, come on, dude. Do something about it. Yeah. Be the change. There you go. Be the difference. That's right. Be the difference. Be the difference. Be the change. Uh, I actually just tagged you and a bunch of people, uh, uh, tagged a bunch of people in that story, uh, and they also run podcasts. So you may be getting hit up to be like, and one of them is a, a, a good buddy of mine. He awesome. also was in the military. Um, he got, he had a, a bad attack. Uh, he's got some, some, uh, wounds. He's purple. He received the purple heart as well. And, um, so him and how you just spent, just spent this past weekend in, in Wisconsin doing an event, speaking on stage and, awesome. and sharing our stories. So, um, he's a good dude. He's got a great podcast. So I'm going to, I'm going to link him up with you and be like, yo, you gotta, you gotta get this guy on your podcast. Bro. I'd love to talk to him, man. I love yeah. <laughs> Again, I love sharing my story. I, I, I do it almost every single day. It's just a part of who I am. And, you yeah. know, people always will say also, um, you know, don't let things in your life like make you become who you are. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that one either, man. Like I, I've embraced what happened to me and it has become who I am because of my injury. I am much better than I was before. So don't let it affect you negatively. Sure. Yeah. But if, if it's positive things, who cares if that shaped you? Let yeah. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rick. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, brother. Thank for you. all of you watching, for all the audience that watched up to now, then you obviously got value. So do me a favor. Go show, go share uh, uh, this story. You know, share it to somebody else that can learn from it, that, that's in a dark spot, that needs that help to grab onto the hope by comparing their situation to somebody that they cannot really compare to because their situation isn't as bad. It may be difficult and it may be in their mind. They may be within a prison in their own mind and they feel like all hope is lost, but it's never lost. It's never lost. So share this with somebody that might also get value from it that needs to hear this message. Uh, you know, it takes you 30, 60 seconds to rate, review, subscribe, and share, but it means the world to both Rick and I. And uh, you can also go show them some love uh, on all of his platforms. This has been the Be the Difference podcast. I'm your host, Greg Birch. Until next time. Deuces.